Good afternoon. No, no, no. I know it's the start of the semester, but come on. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome to the Dean's Innovative Leader Series. This is the first event in our series for this year. For those of you who are new to MIT, perhaps new to the Sloan School, uh, let me just uh, emphasize that this is a wonderful opportunity to meet and to hear from uh, prominent, principled, innovative leaders who are making a huge difference in the world. And I'm so delighted to be able to introduce our speaker for today. We are very fortunate to have with us Dr. Susan Hockfield. Susan is the President Emerita of MIT. She's also a professor of neuroscience at MIT. Susan served as the president from 2004 to 2012. She is the person who has had the greatest responsibility for the development and the accomplishments of MIT over the last very turbulent decade. And it is wonderful to be able to start our year with her thoughts about MIT and about managing and leading. Uh, I won't do the long version of Susan's accomplishments because that would take all of our time, but it wouldn't be fair if we um, don't mention at least a few. Susan led the development at MIT of MIT's Energy Initiative, an initiative that's attracted over $350 million in funding so far for research, policy development, and education, working toward a clean, clean energy future. Susan also led the development of the Koch Institute for Integrative Cancer Studies at MIT, which is hugely important for the very distinctive way that's bringing together engineers and scientists to work on the most important problems in cancer. During the groundbreaking for the Koch Institute, the head of the National Cancer Institute at the time said to the assembled crowd, this is going to be the most important cancer research institute in the world. And he was telling the truth. Susan's also led in conjunction uh, with her counterpart at Harvard University, the creation of edX, the leading online learning platform that has positioned MIT and Harvard together at the forefront of this emerging uh, digital divide um, online learning opportunity. Uh, in part, uh, as recognition of that, the World Economic Forum has asked Susan to be the director of its new online learning initiative as well. Uh, Susan's received more honors and accolades uh, than really we will have patience for me to mention. Um, she also continues to have a number of leadership responsibilities, including serving on the board of General Electric and on the board of Qualcomm. It's a great delight to welcome a friend to all of us at MIT Sloan. Please welcome Dr. Susan Hockfield. Very generous, Thank very you. generous. <clears throat> I'm just gonna grab a cough drop in the event it's necessary. More complicated than I thought. Okay, Talk amongst yourselves. Yeah, no, no, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> I'll look at you in a second, Dave. <clears throat> That's okay. So Susan, we don't know each other. We've never met before this <laughs> afternoon, and so this uh, is all fresh and unrehearsed. All these things, uh, okay. Advanced preparation. <clears throat> you know, I think one place that's really important to start is with the financial crisis. Um, every American university was affected by the crisis. MIT came through that crisis in much better shape than other leading research universities. Can you talk a little bit about why that was, um, what it was like to go through that crisis, and what were some of the most important things that you did as president? Yeah, thanks. Um, it was uh, among the, uh, what I call the trials of Hercules when I started. It was 2008. I had st started in 2004, 2005. Mm -hmm. We had had a, uh, not an easy, I had had not an easy first three years of my presidency. We can talk about the details of that. Um, but among the things that um, we needed to address at the very outset when I arrived was a structural deficit in our budget. Um, and, uh, and I think that part of the reason why we were able to manage through the uh, recession of 08-09 was the work we had done before, um, preparing MIT for a brighter future. 
ended up it was good preparation for a not so bright future also. Um, yeah. But there are a number of reasons why MIT did better and, um, than others. The first is just a very practical one, and it had nothing to do with um, a leadership or maybe actually a default in leadership or something. Uh, but the schools uh, with which we compare ourselves have larger endowments than MIT does. And uh, while the recession hit all of our sources of revenue, uh, private philanthropy dropped, of course, uh, government support dropped and then uh, came back with the ARRA funding, um, but most importantly, the value of our endowments dropped very, very seriously. And so because MIT uses less of endowment to support our total revenue source, we were a little bit better positioned. I ran into the president of um, Carnegie Mellon you know, in the midst of this horrible turmoil, and he said, you know, I've never felt happier with a very small endowment. <laughs> and that gave me some, you know, well, I felt happier that our endowment was somewhat smaller. So that was part of the reason. Um, when I started at MIT, as we said, we had a structural deficit. And, and um, coming from Yale University, which had one of the most conservative um, um, financial structures, um, I saw right away that we needed to fix that. We needed to fix it for a number of reasons. It's unsustainable. But more importantly, if you have an operating deficit, and I, I hope none of you will actually ever be running companies that have one, but you may, what you find is that you're always feel, you always feel like you're apologizing about the past. You're always looking backward. Um, and to relieve MIT of the burden of a, an operating deficit to clear us into a balanced budget so we could look more optimistically about the future was absolutely critical, not just for the finances of the Institute, but for our ethos. Yeah. So we worked very hard, uh, we being, uh, you know, Raphael Reif, who's now the president, was my provost, and uh, Israel Ruiz, who was CFO, Terry Stone, mm -hmm. who was the executive vice president at the time, to design a uh, be a very, very large project that we extended across the entire campus to bring everyone into awareness of why we had to fix it and the kinds of things we needed to do to fix it. So we were very excited as we approached um, the 08, 09 academic year because MIT was going to enter that year with a balanced budget for the first time in decades. Yay! Ha! <laughs> uh, <clears throat> then 08, 09 happened. However, we had managed to get ourselves out of that structural deficit so that yeah. if we hadn't, we would have been really hammered um, by the downturn from the recession. So that was a very great thing to do. And I've forgotten who says this, but um, you know, when, I think it may be Warren Buffett. Uh, when the tide goes out, you find out who's swimming without any shorts. Yeah. Uh, guess what? <laughs> Uh, we discovered there were a lot of schools that had structural deficits uh, that had been, you know, kind of, you know, papering them over. And so the recession revealed, um, I think, all of the financial economic uh, softness uh, for those who had it. So that was one reason. The other thing that it did for us, which is more of a community thing, mm -hmm. is we approached our deficit reduction process by engaging the community. And we therefore had the sense among the community that this was a way to manage through a crisis. Manage through a problem was, you know, kind of all hands on deck, let's bring everyone in and solve it together so we didn't have to invent that process for dealing with the further economic difficulties of the recession. So that was a huge benefit that we had kind of been, um, we had done the uh, dress rehearsal <laughs> in a sense for the recession. Um, uh, so that, that, that very much helped. Um, I think, um, Another uh, piece of it was that um, in dealing with the reductions that we required during the recession, we incorporated into that planning for the future. So as we were cutting, we were also building. And so we didn't lose the community in kind of the morass of loss we also built in you know, a real sense of, of optimism about the future. And yeah. it was, uh, I would say, a management tool I didn't know I had, <laughs> we had. Um, but it's enormously important uh, during tough times is to be positive about the future. You know, I learned a lot, of, a lot about leadership. Uh, you learn a lot about leadership during tough times. And um, I just, uh, you know, in my mind, I can recall 
meeting after meeting in the fall of 2008, where various individuals in leadership positions around MIT would make an appointment to see me and come to my office, and it was almost a confessional moment when they would tell me just how terrible it really was. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, as a leader, um, I learned a huge amount about supporting people in their organizations as they came to understand, encouraging them to come to understand uh, the seriousness of the dilemma, but also encouraging them to have the sense of, uh, you know, can do, we can get out of this and we can build something better. And, uh, you know, among the things I learned was the importance of, of team building and working together on things. And, we put in place a set of reports, basically. Um, I needed to keep track of, you know, what my, you know, seven, eight, you know, you know most, most vulnerable, my direct reports, what was happening in each of their activities. And so we developed a weekly report where everyone could see, you know, what your worst problem was and how it was evolving. And so we actually had a lot of transparency, a tremendous amount of teamwork um, uh, to help us manage through a really terrible crisis, but we did it. We did it quite well. So I was very proud of what the MIT, how the MIT community handled it. Did it build a team that um, stayed together in some ways for the time after the crisis as well? You know, it, yeah. um, it, it seems to me that you elevated some people during that time or gave them particular responsibilities um, that maybe helped them grow. I just, yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, it's lots of fun when things are going well and um, lots of fun to celebrate. But in my experience, uh, there is no stronger team building than when you go through really tough times together. And uh, this business of revealing to all of my direct reports the challenges in each of their domains mm -hmm. and having them help as we puzzled through how to solve them yeah. was the you know, arguably the most important team building experience. And also, um, you know, I think we'll come to this, <clears throat> but there was so much work that needed to be done uh, that people were empowered to do stuff that they just would never have been empowered to do before. Yeah. And that raised their ability. Yeah. And, um, yeah. you know, I hate to be Pollyanna-ish about it, but <laughs> it ended up being uh, very good for the Institute in the better years that followed. So you talked about leadership and how it changed you in some ways. Uh, uh, as you all know, uh, Susan had a series of leadership responsibilities that grew at Yale University, uh, leading to her serving Yale as provost uh, before coming to MIT and serving as president. And um, if you could talk a little bit more about uh, how you came through an incredibly successful academic career to a position of managing and leading, um, and if there were moments or maybe surprises or lessons that you would like to leave some of the people here mm. about that journey and about where it, where it took you, where you've come to. Yeah, so um, I was not as wise as any of you. Uh, I um, did not imagine for an instant that uh, any kind of leadership, academic leadership, would be in my career plan. I was so delighted, blessed to discover scientific research as my passion, and then to be able to do it in great places. I mean, just an absolute delight. And I, um, like many faculty, um, I often say, uh, you know, academic leadership is a bit of an oxymoron. Academics don't want leaders. Uh, they don't think they need leaders, and I was certainly very <clears throat> soundly in that camp. Um, so why would you want to do that thing that yeah. shouldn't exist? Um, I, I, I learned differently, but, but for me it was a very big uh, leap to go from a position of you know, running a successful lab. I think I had just decided that you know, maybe I would entertain some of the invitations I was getting to look at a, a department chair role. Mm -hmm. Uh, when uh, the opportunity arose for me to become dean of the graduate school at Yale. The reason I decided to do it actually was quite personal. It wasn't that I had leadership ambition. I still kind of said, you know, you know, it's leadership stuff. You know, I'm not sure it's for me. 
Um, you know, the scientific enterprise is about entrepreneurship and independence. It's not about cohesion. It's not about consensus building. It is about doing your own thing as fast as you possibly can and bringing your you know, reasonable size group. I think my research group was as big as you know, 15 or 18 at one point, but you know, it's not a gigantic group. And you know, managing 15 or 18 people on this scientific adventure is a very different uh, activity <laughs> than uh, you know, working with these very large institutions. But for me, my uh, graduate education had been absolutely um, the most transformational experience of my life. It gave me direction, it gave me purpose, it gave me a, you know, something I could just pour my passion into. It was so important, and I so benefited from the people who had made that possible. And uh, at the time that uh, Rick Levin, who was then president of Yale, invited me to be dean of the graduate school, um, there were just some parts of the operation of the graduate school that were just, let's just say, in need of renovation. One of my colleagues said, we have a lot of deferred maintenance and the graduate school is part of it. Mm -hmm. And so um, I saw just some, you know, what I thought were pretty obvious fixes that we could do. So I said, you know, okay, I'll do this for three years and then go back to the lab because uh, Yale graduate students should have the opportunity of an experience like the one I had. And in their graduate education, they should be able to become themselves, <laughs> which was what had happened to me. Yep. And so I did it uh, because of a sense of, of um, giving back, perhaps. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> now, something very interesting happened. Um, you know, being on the, um, the faculty side of the divide, I was a little embarrassed that I had agreed to take on this oxymoronic task of academic leadership. <laughs> and um, uh, there were two people who um, I was going to tell in advance of the announcement. And I was, I can't tell you how anxious I was about telling them. I, I'll tell you one story so, so about one of them. So I had been on the scientific staff at the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory under the directorship of Jim Watson. Uh, with Francis Crick, the uh, discoverers of the, the structure of DNA. An amazing genius, a strange and marvelous man, but an amazing genius who had been an, a wonderful mentor to me, just a wonderful mentor. So I had to call him and tell him that I had decided to do this terrible thing. And uh, so <laughs> with much foreboding, I dialed him up and I said, hey, Jim, uh, uh, I just wanted to let you know uh, that I have agreed uh, to take on the role of dean of the graduate school. I mean, so <laughs> I, I, I said it so he could understand. But without a pause, I mean, in a nanosecond, he said, that's fantastic. Most people don't know that it matters who runs a university. Mm -hmm. No one had told me it mattered who ran a university, <laughs> but yeah. uh, he understood. And, and you know, for me, that gave me kind of that, that liberated me to understand this role in a new way. Mm -hmm. It matters who runs any organization, and the best organizations are run in ways that you hardly know that it's going on. It's you know, kind of in the um, you know invisible background. So that was the first really important transition was actually deciding to take on a set of responsibilities uh, for which I was you know unprepared. Um, but also didn't really understand that, and that was really important. Mm -hmm. The graduate school at Yale organized very differently from MIT. Um, uh, just over 2,000 students, about 60 roughly graduate programs that the graduate school had responsibility uh, for oversight. And my staff uh, in this graduate school itself was about 35 people, mm -hmm. and then beyond that, you know, uh, you know, into the departments and programs. Um, Within a couple of years, in an organization that size, I felt that I could personally understand a huge amount of that organization. So I had confidence. As a scientist, I like to, you know, understand things from its very base. You know, uh, and so I could do that in the graduate school. Mm -hmm. That size of organization, you can do as kind of a one-person show. Mm -hmm. The next next big transition for me in leadership was becoming provost at Yale. Yale is a little larger than MIT. Um, very a big big operation. Um, I think you know, 12, 13,000 students. MIT is about 11,000 students. Mm -hmm. um, a medical school, a law school, you know, 12 professional schools, and then the college and the graduate school. Lots of moving parts. Um, so I realized, uh, again, with some shock, that I could not 
know enough to make decisions independently. And that meant that I was going to have to rely on my direct reports in a way I had never before. In the past, I could test people. I knew enough to kind of you know, probe them and say, what do you mean, Dave, about you know, that course? I know enough about that course to you know, say, I'm not sure it's being taught so well. You know, that, that was gone when you become uh, you know, a leader in this big organization. And that was uh, a, you know, a critical transition in understanding leadership. And understanding, I mean, I knew that the people around me were important. The people around me became critically important. I had to trust them. I had to learn how to learn from them. I had to learn how to, you know, help them learn from, you know, get you know, set up conditions so they could learn from one another. It's a very different level of management. And that was, again, hard for me personally, but very important in terms of uh, understanding uh, the key elements for leadership. I would say the, the third, um, big leadership transition is a little odd one, and again, it's a little bit personal, uh, was in coming to MIT as president. I had not appreciated um, how iconic the president of a university is and how important that role is. So you can say, oh, no, 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 I'm not going to be you know, the university's icon. I'm just going to be me. Uh, and um, I can tell you, there is no opportunity to be me when you are the president of the university. Your job is to be the leader of the university. Your job is to represent the university. Your job is to guard the university. It is not to be me. And um, there are a lot of roles you take on. Um, a lot of, um, I would say, you know, honor and glory with which I was personally very uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. um, but there are things you just have to do, and, and a person you have to be that's very different from mm -hmm. this kind of adolescent view of, you know, I, I'm just going to be me. Uh, it, it's not about you. <laughs> it's about, it, it is very much about the institution and representing the institution, increasing the impact of the institution, uh, understanding, uh, you know, with your community what the institution can do, desires to do, might do, and doing everything you can so that the people in the organization can um, excel at levels that they never imagined possible for themselves. So, and, and that was, it was a little, you know, that was a big transition uh, to move into that role. Yeah. Can I ask you a question then about that transition to MIT that may be a little bit difficult, but um, some people might say that you came to MIT as an outsider. You came as a newcomer. You weren't here at MIT for generations, mm -hmm. uh, as many have been. Is there something about the leadership moments that you had at MIT that related to, that, that seemed connected to the coming as fresh eyes or coming as an outsider or coming as a newcomer? You can say it in a happy way or in a more mm -hmm. challenging way. No, I think it's a fascinating question. And I think it's a fascinating organizational question. And each of you will address this question um, at some scale, mm -hmm. which is there are times for any unit, any organization, where uh, when there's a leadership transition, um, continuity, leadership from the inside, is clearly the best direction. And there are times in any organization where um, you know, leadership from the outside, bringing in new ideas, new perspectives, is um, the right direction. You know, and any of you can come up with a list of why one or the other direction is important. And clearly, um, the MIT Corporation in electing me as president felt that this was a time for MIT when bringing someone from the outside uh, to the institute um, was important. So you come from the outside with um, you know, your own history, your own perspectives, and uh, the learning curve is very steep. Um, but a lot of uh, new leaders, and I see this happen all the time, make the mistake of thinking that they were brought in to create a replica of where they were at the new place, and that's never the right solution. <laughs> when I was introduced to the, uh, the Yale community in 10250, I, um, I, I tried to capture it by saying that I wasn't going to bring a, a kennel of Yale bulldogs with me. <laughs> so, um, you know, it, 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 my job at MIT was to make help MIT be the best MIT, and not to transform MIT into Yale. However. Um, External perspectives help. I mentioned the, uh, uh, the financial situation that I uh, found. Uh, I would never have had the sensitivity to that that I had coming from the outside. 
And you know, it probably would have been okay to muddle through a structural deficit for you know however long if we hadn't had a recession. Right. I, I mean, it would have been really an almost impossible uh, financial crisis for MIT if we had not relieved the structural deficit before the recession hit. But I didn't know that a recession was coming. I just thought, wow, this is um, a uh, non-optimal way of operating. We can fix this. Let's figure out how to fix it. And we fixed it in a very MIT way. I can, you know, I, I, you know we, we tried to do similar elements of it at Yale, not because of a structural deficit, but for other reasons, and failed. So I, I, you know, there were things we could do at MIT that we could not do um, at Yale University. Yeah. I think um, there is a natural mistrust um, by any community when an outsider comes in. She doesn't know us. Um, we don't know her. And there's a tremendous amount of work that has to go and, in. And, I'm sorry to interrupt, but, and mm -hmm. it's an easy narrative if someone wants to get in your, if someone wants you not to do the things that you want to sure. do. It's, it's there, you can say it. That's right. What does she know about MIT? Yeah. But I would say that um, <laughs> simply, <laughs> When I became provost, uh, one of the deputy provosts at Yale who had been there a very long time gave me some fantastic advice. He said, you're new. You can say that for about a year, and then you can't say it anymore. Say it as often as you can. <laughs> I'm new. Explain to me what you are thinking. I'm new. I don't know about that. I can't make a decision instantly, but why don't you tell me a little bit about it? And so it's a, the most wonderful, you know, learning opening. I'm new. Tell me about your problem. I haven't heard about your problem before. You know, you know, and so um, it was, it, people um, would give me more information because they didn't assume that I already knew things. So uh, what a wonderful way to learn about a place, uh, you know, from the perspective of really you know, I just don't know so much, and I need to learn from you. And that was great. However, the same person who um, gave me the advice about using the I'm new, uh, and you know, depending on where you are, you might be allowed to be new for a week or a month or as much as a year, but you know, as long as you can get away with it, uh, do it. <laughs> but he also <laughs> gave me the, uh, the dead cat rule. And the dead cat rule goes like this. Someone enters your office with her dead cat. And she says, oh, your awful predecessor killed my cat, and I would like you to revive it. And he said, don't revive any dead cats. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm new, explain it to me, but, uh, but the answer is not um, the, you know, the dead cats will live again, because then you just have to rehearse the things that were already done. Yeah, yeah. Um, hmm. Besides coming as a newcomer to MIT, <clears throat> Uh, whether you wanted to be an icon in this way or not, um, you have a visibility as a leader um, who's a woman of a leading American research institution. Um, is there something that you have thought or felt about that? It, was it relevant to you or not that much of a relevance? Yeah, it's a... Um a good question, and a question I've been asked a lot. And uh, you know, it's usually posed um, far less um, thoughtfully than you've posed it, which is, is it different being president of MIT as a woman than as a man? How would I know? I only did it one way, I, I don't know. It seemed like a good way to ask it. Um, and um, I think, uh, again, this is part of the uh, iconic status of the president that is very important and frankly important for all leaders. Mm -hmm. um, you know, again, we, we deceive ourselves in imagining that we're just going to be me uh, because there are a lot of people looking at you as who they could be. And they're not going to be me. They're going to be themselves. And I had not appreciated when um, I was elected how impactful being the first uh, woman president of MIT would be. It was huge. Um, I got uh, emails and letters from young women in Thailand and China, uh, you know, all over the world, uh, expressing their excitement, their delight, their hope, their hope, uh, because I was the president, a woman was president of MIT. 
and carrying that um, re responsibility uh, for the inspiration of more than a generation, very important. Yeah, I, you know, among the most moving things that happened is um, uh, women not my generation, but I would say, um, you know, kind of uh, two generations ahead, women maybe 10 years older than I or more, came up to me literally with tears coming down their cheeks uh, saying, um, I never thought I would live to see the day when a woman was president of MIT. Mm -hmm. So this moment in the nations, in the world's changing, right? <laughs> you know, I thought, well, it's done. I mean, they're already, you know, in Nan Cohen was president of Duke years ago. You know, Shirley Tillman at Princeton, well, yeah, what's the big deal? It's a big deal at MIT, <laughs> uh, a very big deal for the world. And I think uh, one of the things that we sometimes remember, but I think insufficiently, MIT's role in the nation and the world, how important we are, as I often said, mm -hmm. Um, you know, a beacon of inspiration. Uh, there are people who believe that they can do things because it's done at MIT. Mm -hmm. And that was very much um, how people saw uh, my role yeah. as, as, uh, as, as uh, the first woman president. Within MIT, I think um, a very important signal, a very important moment. Uh, but uh, in terms of how MIT thinks about itself, what was much more disruptive uh, than my being a woman was that, uh, you know, I was the first biologist uh, to be president. Uh, and that, you know, it, uh, that was a much harder pill to swallow. Um, there were people, I have to tell you, uh, you know, after my point was announced, people from the outside would say, but MIT doesn't do biology. I said, oh, yes, it does. Yes, it does. <laughs> Not only does it do biology, but in federal funding, the National Institutes of Health is the largest funder of work at MIT, so it, it's no longer uh, you know, solely the province of the Department of Energy and the Department of Defense. Uh, and so I, I think it was also important in terms of getting that word out, uh, you know, representing that MIT uh, does extraordinary biology and has been doing extraordinary biology since the 1950s. Uh, very important, impactful. And frankly, um, one of the things that I worked on a lot was raising the visibility of um, you know, something that I believe MIT does uniquely well, which is working at the convergence of biology with engineering and the physical sciences. Mm -hmm. uh, absolutely a unique opportunity for MIT that we're doing a lot of, um, but largely unknown. And that still, that, that remains one of the, um, I think the most important um, messages that I deliver around the nation and the world. You know, we could have mentioned the development of Kendall Square and your role in that mm -hmm. also as uh, one of the consequences of your presidency, but looking at the growth of the life sciences um, uh, and, and the way that mm -hmm. MIT has been important for the world, but also for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, um, for the United States, in bringing um, this kind of epicenter of life sciences research here. Can you talk a little bit more about the role of MIT in the United States and um, maybe your role as president in trying to uh, reach out to industry, reach out to government, mm -hmm. and um, be sure that we have, if you like to call it, the ecosystem of economic development that we need. Yeah, um, very, very important elements of MIT's uh, presence in the region, the nation, and the world. Uh, I feel like I have very little um, responsibility for what's happened to Kendall Square. However, one of the, um, you know, one of the tools, one of the uh, controls that you actually do have your hands and feet on as president is the accelerator. <laughs> the starter, not so much, <laughs> but the accelerator, a lot. And so, um, of course, when I arrived, I learned a lot about Kendall Square, and it was coming along. And, you know, frankly, by saying and doing a bit around, can this happen faster? You know, can we accelerate this? It, it certainly had an impact. Uh, MIT has been focused on its role in the nation. My predecessor, the late Chuck Vest, an amazing president, wonderful human being, uh, really built out MIT's role in Washington, which has been important since before World War II. So, you know, MIT has played a really important role in helping develop sound policies for research and education in Washington. Mm -hmm. Chuck was all over that and, and really expanded that role. Mm -hmm. 
Internationally, MIT has been important. Uh, MIT um, helped uh, start the IITs in India in the, uh, you know, the middle of the 20th century. Obviously, we have been engaging in the world. Uh, but locally, not so much, or not as much as I felt was important. And so I stepped up our engagement locally, you know, beyond getting permits from the city of Cambridge to build the buildings we want to build, you know, really engaging with the city to, you know, help not just Kendall Square uh, thrive, but also uh, greater Boston and the state. So I worked a lot with uh, Governor Patrick. Uh, one of the signature and I think important uh, uh, projects was the green high-performance computing center that we did as a, an unprecedented, and people said it couldn't be done, collaboration yeah. uh, between four universities, the Commonwealth, and uh, two companies, EMC and Raytheon, yeah. uh, EMC, sorry, and Cisco, mm -hmm. uh, to put our high-performance computing in Holyoke. Yeah. I don't know how many of you have been to Holyoke. Anyone been to Holyoke? Not so many. I would just simply say you don't need to go to Detroit. You just need to go to Western Massachusetts. And it's a place that industry was once thriving and fueling the economy of the nation. But that once was actually at the beginning of the 20th century. And then uh, the mills moved south and offshore, and nothing has happened since in that part of the state. It is shocking that you can get in a car and drive to a place that looks like Detroit. Um, and so, uh, in the interest of reviving that part of the state and helping revive that part of the state, uh, electricity is cheap, it's green. Yeah. Uh, there is, um, uh, thanks to the dot-com bubble, back then uh, there is a uh, fiber optic, optic highway that runs along the highway around along 90, so it doesn't make any difference if you're sitting here at MIT. You can use that facility as easily as you can do use one across the street. And so we, uh, we built that with an idea of crystallizing a kind of industry development in Western Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. uh, I hope that will help. Um, but it was an example of a project that I did with the governor, I think really important. Yes. But again, MIT's impact is huge. You know, I, uh, it was important for MIT to be the lead on that project. Yeah. And um, very important to have the University of Massachusetts, Jack Wilson, who was then uh, mm -hmm. uh, president of the university system, yeah. you know, help pull that together. And these are, it's, it's exciting. It's exciting to use, you know, what we do on campus to um, create greater opportunities for us, but also greater opportunities uh, for the state and the nation. Also engaging internationally has become increasingly important, as you well know. I mean, Sloan has really led, uh, in many ways, MIT's international uh, activities, and uh, I think set some very, very wise uh, models for engaging. You know, I also, uh, you know, want to include this point that, you know, MIT, you know, from its founding, from its founding, has been engaged in tech transfer, yeah. has been engaged in collaborating with industry. Another area where <clears throat> I think coming out of Yale, I saw the great opportunities here mm -hmm. compared to what really we couldn't really do at Yale. Yeah. And uh, you mentioned the energy initiative. You know, that 350 plus million dollars comes from industry, and it's yeah. about partnerships between industry and the academy that allows industry to explore directions they couldn't do on their own, mm -hmm. brings us the knowledge of the marketplace that we would not have on our own, you know, together with our, you know, yeah. our, our, our faculty and our students. I mean, it's such an exciting uh, uh, coming together, a collaboration. And as I, I don't know many places that could do that the way MIT has done. And I think it's very important for MIT to continue to, you know, walk that, uh, a collaborative frontier between industry and the academy and set out, again, policies that allow us to do it while maintaining the academic privileges and protections that we need, but also being sure that what we do on campus gets out to, into the marketplace and into the world. And this is a reason why, you know, Sloan figures so prominently, and Frank, I would say more prominently in the ecosystem of MIT than business schools do in the ecosystem of their universities in general. Yeah. <clears throat> that sounds like a fantastic place to take a moment. <laughs> and uh, having seen uh, visionary leadership translated into real progress uh, in an important organization, do you have some questions for President Hockfield? Or comments? Personal anecdotes? While you're thinking of one, 
let me, there was one other question I wanted yeah. to ask you if I had a chance, and that is, with all the change that mm -hmm. you've prompted and seen at MIT, is there something that stands out in your mind as a point of pride, as a, uh, something that you, you know, you tend to look back on as a, um, uh, a, a bit of a signature? It could be something you've already mentioned. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, um, that's a great question. And uh, one of the uh, amazing things about uh, being president of a place like MIT, there are thousands of things going on that are exciting and wonderful. It's an exhilarating. I mean, it's just exhilarating to be able to, you know, kind of see, uh, you know, all of the amazing things that are happening and just uh, world-changing developments. I think that uh, the difficulty for any organization, for any organization, is making uh, the whole larger than the sum of the parts. It's a cliche, but man, is it true. I'm a neuroscientist, and one of the things that um, has kind of fascinated me late in life, not early on. You know, early on, I was very interested in what goes on inside the box of the skull, and it's where most of neuroscience is done which is understanding the, the parts uh, and how the parts work together inside. Uh, you know, when we think about what the most compelling stimulus is for us, uh, you know, it's not um, you know, passively sitting here and being able to feel the arms of the chair. And, you know, I used to run, like to run. It's conversation. So it's what happens, as I say, between the boxes. And the amplification of your understanding that happens when you're understanding it with someone else or through someone else's eyes, you know, just uh, it can't be done. Very hard to be done any other way. And you know, universities since you know 11, 7, 1076 when Bologna was established has been about scholars, thoughtful people coming together to get greater understanding through communication through talking to one another. And so it is what the university is about. And so what I'm, what gives me the greatest uh, pleasure and the greatest joy is to think of, you know, and see places where, you know, I, I, you, know you and you and you, I talked to you separately, and you had great ideas, but they're related. Could I please bring you together and then create something that, you know, really, uh, you know, where the magic happens? And you know, we had the opportunity to do that in a number of ways. You mentioned the Energy Initiative, the Koch Institute for Integrative Cancer Research, the, you know, the High Performance Computing Center. I mean, these are all examples of you know, creating venues or opportunities for people to bring their intelligences yeah. together yeah. and create an intelligence that vastly exceeds that of any of the individuals. Yeah. I have to, you, you know this is true. So the deans, the provosts, chancellors of MIT would gather on Tuesday mornings, and one of the things you were known for saying is, many flowers, where's the garden? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> when uh, people talked about what the difference was gonna be between having a man and a woman president of MIT, I said, well, the metaphors yeah. are not gonna come out of, out of sports yeah. or, you know, or the military. The metaphors are coming out of gardening and cooking. <laughs> And that was my too often used one, you know, lots of beautiful flowers, no garden. You know, <laughs> let, let's figure out how to, how to get a garden out of all these flowers. But you did. Yeah, thank you. We have some questions. Important question. Thank you for asking, and a sensitive one. Um, uh, uh, so, when I became president in 2004, it was uh, we faced a similar uh, set of really tragic uh, deaths, suicides, and a number of legal cases that flowed from them. 
And MIT was in the news all the time, all the time, all the time. And it's a very um, difficult uh, problem to sort through how a community uh, responds to personal, uh, you know, they're not personal tragedies, they're community tragedies. And, um, you know, every president has his or her own style. Uh, this was, you know, for me, um, you know, like, like the, the, the operating deficit, I couldn't talk about that a lot, but we went after it. Similarly, around this issue of student culture. Um, the first thing I did was get the data. And um, while there were uh, assertions that somehow MIT's uh, suicide rate was higher than, you know, our peer institutions, that ended up to be false. Um, you know, of course, there's always a sampling problem, but if you look at 10-year bins and look at it over the long term, uh, you know, 15 to 30-year-olds, it's a very vulnerable group. Uh, the rate of suicide is actually lower on college campuses than it is out in the world. And MIT was, you know, the numbers were with everyone else. You get an anomalous year. At any school, you get an anomalous year, and it's just awful, awful. But what's important to understand is it is not, you know, it, you know, MIT is not anomalous. People want ma to make MIT look anomalous, and boy, you know, do people love saying that it's the pace and pressure at MIT? I don't think it's the pace and pressure at MIT. Um, it is, there is, however, I think, I think, you know, much to be done in terms of um, building a sense of community. And so one of the places that I worked very hard on was um, having come from Yale. So this is, again, an example of things that I saw someplace else that I thought wasn't directly applicable here. But frankly, there were lessons, you know, and, 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 and strategies, tactics we could apply here. Uh, the residential communities uh, for undergraduates are not as robust as they could be. And so I worked very hard with the housemasters uh, to give them a sense of belonging and being, you know, important people in the community and a sense of, you know, obviously they already had a sense of responsibility to be sure they had the tools and the wherewithal and the support of the president. Spent a lot of time with students being out in the community. You know, um, cultures don't change <laughs> very much. You know, they can shift and there you can draw out. Uh, as I said, you don't get your hands on the starter, but you can get your, you get your foot on the accelerator and the steering wheel. And so, um, you know, figuring out what are the, um, you know, the great foundational elements that are there that we can use in building them up. And so we, uh, you know, made some progress in that direction. Um, it's a bad year, uh, a very bad year. And um, I think as a community to um, not, um, you know, view this as, you know, something, e, you know, this is weird about MIT and we should be defensive about it, but to say, you know, this is a very sad situation, hard for the community. And what's important is that we reach out to one another. I had a session with my freshman advisees on Tuesday talking about this, and um, I think, you know, uh, MIT is not, um, uh, you know, it's a very different kind of place uh, from other kinds of schools, and I think understanding that we need to make extra effort uh, to create the kind of sense of community that is not going to be an, I mean, it, it, this is a problem that does not go away. Um, but being sure we understand it and understand, most importantly, our personal responsibility for helping one another and um, hoping that we can convey to those who feel that there's no place to turn, that there are places to turn, that there are friends and people who they trust. Um, hi. There's a, there's a Thank you very much for the talk. Very interesting. Um, great work on the policies at MIT and Yale. Um, I do have one question, though. Can you uh, talk about your personal recollection of the Aaron Swartz case? I, find, I would find that very interesting. Uh, no, I can't. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Excuse me, Chris. There we go. We get one right here. Hi. Um, thanks for coming to speak with us today. Um, I, I had read this awesome article in the New York Times about a year ago that was about um, women in science. And it actually featured several prof professors from Yale and MIT. And um, they were talking about how it's really hard within the culture of academia for 
women to move up within the political system to higher places. And you seem like you've been very successful in doing that. And I was wondering if you could just share any stories that reflect maybe the struggles that you had during that time or um, what you did differently to be so successful. Thank you. Um, I would say it, it, I'm not an anomaly anymore. <laughs> there are a lot of women who are, uh, actually there was an article in the Wall Street Journal yesterday about the, you're know, just looking at, I hate this approach, the economic man approach, but uh, the top 0.1% of, of income earners and the top 1%, it just exploded in terms of women it, it being represented, which is great. Um, if you're gonna succeed by whatever measure, it's good that women are being successful. Um, so I think that, uh, you know, for me, uh, I have always been very focused on uh, what I was passionate about. And it wasn't that I aimed to, I mean, obviously I aimed to get tenure. I really aimed to get tenure. Um, it, but um, get, aiming to get tenure means you aim to do fabulous research, get it published, and um, you know, have people know about it. Uh, and so I think uh, being very focused on the task at hand is incredibly important. And the other thing, um, someone asked me, <laughs> I reported on a conversation I had had in my first you know, early weeks at MIT, and someone asked me, uh, I was reporting on a conversation with a, a man I'd had, and uh, it was actually a man who said to me, was he being condescending to you? And I thought, wow, what an interesting question. I, I, and my response was, you know, if I paid attention to when people were being condescending to me, I couldn't get out of bed in the morning. I, I, I don't know. I, you know, that wasn't that wasn't part of my calculation. So I think part of it is just just not not being not being we're not pay, not paying any attention to the things that don't matter. So keeping focused on the things that matter rather than getting distracted by the little you know things that could be insults. Maybe they're insults. Maybe not. Who cares? That's not part of you know, the path to success. And so I think being focused on getting done what you want to get done and not worrying that there are people around you who say you can't do it. I mean, I, I gather that's probably how I did it because I wasn't paying attention uh, that there weren't um, many women in the room when I was in the room. Susan, thank you. I, I want to acknowledge that some people have class at one o'clock. Ah, so, so that's why they're leaving. It's not that I've disappointed them? Indeed, uh, <laughs> the, the, it is not. Uh, thank you. I, uh, I know you all um, have the sense that MIT is an important and dynamic organization and should have great leadership. Please thank Susan for spending this time with us. Thank you.